I'm delighted to introduce to you today Dr. Song Tan, who is currently the Vern M. Williman Chair in Molecular Biology at Penn State. Dr. Chan, Dr. Tan trained in the lab of Tim Richmond and has since made huge contributions to our understanding of both chromatin and transcription through the lens of structural biology. Uh, Dr. Tan has won many, many awards, and I'm going to just name a few. Uh, he was named a Pew Scholar when he began his lab and is currently a AAAS Fellow. And most importantly to me, I think, is that not only has Dr. Tan won awards for his science, but he's also won awards for his teaching, highlighting his broad contributions to the scientific community as a whole. Dr. Tan's lab has made wonderful contributions to our understanding of chromatin and transcription, but also he has further uh, out contributed to our community by having his lab create these ladders for DNA, uh, DNA ladders uh, that are easily accessible and very low cost. Um, and I believe you guys had undergrads working on those projects, if I remember. So um, that's just really wonderful. So I'm really excited to hear Dr. Tan's work today about how uh, chromatin factors recognize the, the beautiful structure of the nucleosome. And um, without any further ado, I will uh, give the floor to Dr. Tan. Thank you so much. Okay, Christine, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, Thank you, all the organizers, uh, for the invitation, but in particular for, for organizing this series. Uh, you know, we talked uh, just before the uh, at 12 o'clock about how wonderful this resource is. And so thank, thanks again for, for doing this. So um, what I'd like to do today is, is really take a step back in some ways and not focus on um, any one or two structures, but really look at all the information we've gotten just in the last couple of years. Um, and, really this question of how is the nucleosome recognized by, by chromatin enzymes. And so um, I'd like to remind you of what the nucleosome is actually, the structure of the nucleosome, the architecture of the nucleosome. And then I'll sort of remind you of some of the structures that we've seen and then really do this review. I think it's really an opportune time right now to look at the structures, all the wonderful structures that have come out recently and look for principles, not just anecdotal information, but now we've got enough structures, we can actually dive in and look for, for, for principles. And um, Rob McGinty and I have written a review for current opinions in structural biology. It's been accepted and hopefully it'll be coming out uh, very soon. And um, these are basically the conclusions we came from staring at, you know, more than 60 structures uh, uh, over the last uh, couple of months. And then, as Christine points out, um, we've um, engaged undergrads here at Penn State, some wonderful undergrads at Penn State, and uh, we've developed reagents which are useful to the entire molecular biology community. And I'd like to touch on that at the very, very end. So, you know, you're listening to the series, you know about the nucleosome. You know that our DNA, every cell in our body has, you know, two meters of DNA. Um, which is stuffed into a nucleus, which is only about six microns across. So how is the nucleosome organized? Um, you know, how do we get a compaction? So um, it's very difficult to sort of imagine what six meters going into a diameter of a, a nucleus is only six microns in diameter, what that actually means. And so uh, my favorite uh, analogy is uh, that's equivalent to taking 30 miles of thread or 50 kilometers of thread and stuffing it into a basketball. So, you know, there's... Obviously, you need to have some kind of organizing principle. And that organizing principle is, you know, is the nucleosome. So we all know that the nucleosome contains uh, an optima of four histones, and it's a core particle, contains an optima of four histones, wrapped by about 150 base pairs of DNA. But I'd like to just take a few minutes to remind you of, uh, based on the initial structural work, um, Karen Luger in Tim Richmond's lab solved the original structure in 1997, and Kurt Davy then solved a high-resolution structure. This is showing the high-resolution structure. I'd like to spend a few minutes just reminding you of the architecture. So it all comes down to the histone form. It looks very complicated, but there's really only two principles you need to know to understand how the nucleosome is actually formed. So I'm going to use the following. So uh, I'm going to focus in on histone H3, just the histone fold of histone H3. And what you'll see is it forms the histone fold, which is a short helix, a loop, a long helix, a loop, and a short helix. So that's the histone fold. And it looks like it's empty in here. And it's empty because it wants its partner, H4, 
which also forms a histone fold, also with short helix loop, long helix uh, loop, short helix. And this crescent-like structure is actually what's going to bind the DNA around it. So that's histone H3H4. Exactly the same thing happens with histone H2A and H2B. So I'm going to focus first on histone H2B. And you'll see that it mirrors exactly what we just saw with histone H3. So alpha 1, loop 1, alpha 2, loop 2, alpha 3. That's the histone fold. Looks empty. Looks lonely. It wants its partner, histone H2A, which forms uh, the heterodimeric partner to histone H2B and forms the same crescent-like structure again. That's going to be organizing principle for wrapping DNA around it. All right, so th that's one of the two principles is the histone fold as a heterodimeric structure. I'm going to show you the, the same sort of things in a slightly different view. I'm just going to stick with this view and show you how we build up those units into the optima. And so we've got the H3H4 dimer over here. It's going to heterodimerize around a four helix bundle over here to make the H3H4 tetramer. H2H2B also makes a, a four helix bundle interaction. It's between H4 and H2B. That's what organizes it, allows the dimer to bind to the tetramer. And then, of course, DNA wraps around it. So relatively simple principles that can explain um, the, the one-fold you know, uh, structure that is in the nucleosome. And this is just to remind you again of this crescent-like structure. And I really want to focus here on alpha-1, loop-1, and then you have alpha-2, loop-2, and alpha-3. And this alpha-1, loop-1 is one of the uh, uh, things that I want to come back to towards the end of the talk. Now, this is actually my favorite way of looking at the nucleosome. Um, in in uh, space filling representation, and I love this because it really shows the, the interesting surfaces that are available um, to chromatin enzymes. So when I started my lab in 1998, um, you know, we had the structure of the nucleosome. And the first time I saw the structure of the nucleosome, one thing that struck me was just how much of the surface was accessible. And we were just starting at that point to understand that there were chromatin enzymes that were going to work on the nucleosome, not just on the histone, but on the nucleosome. And so when I started my lab, I uh, started working on histone acetyl transferases together with Jerry Workman when he was still here and at, at, here at Penn State. And over the next few years, um, I was persuaded by a really talented uh, technician in the lab, Will Selleck, to tackle not just the enzymes, but you know, the enzymes on the nucleosome. And so when we started the work in about 2000, 2001, the sort of basic fundamental questions we had were, how is the nucleosome recognized? I did my postdoc work working on transcription factors. And by that point, we had pretty good ideas of principles that underline how transcription factors interact with DNA. But we didn't have that for the nucleosome. And so the questions that, that I wanted to address were, were there hot spots in the nucleosome that would you know, be areas that a lot of transcription, uh, sorry, chromatin factors would bind to? Um, and would there be guiding principles for how things would interact in the nucleosome? Because you look at the nucleosome, you've got the histones, you've got the DNA, there's lots of the histone surfaces accessible. If you look at the DNA, one thing that's very interesting is that the DNA gyres line up, you know, the grooves line up across the gyres, and that cannot just be a coincidence. And so those were the sole questions, and I sort of figured it would take a long time before we would answer all those questions. And surprisingly, with just a few structures in the first few years, you know, we were able to, to uh, determine some of these guiding principles, and I'm going to elaborate on them today. So just going to remind you of the early days of solving structures on the nucleosome, some of the important structures that came out. So uh, the first structure of uh, something on the nucleosome was, determined, was of a Lana, um, um, the Lana peptide from a herpes virus. Uh, this was done by Karen Luger and her colleagues. Um, and it showed a short peptide bound to the nucleosome. This peptide actually was soaked into nucleosome crystals. And it bound to the acidic patch. We'll come back to the acidic patch. Um, and there was a critical arginine that made interaction in the acidic patch. My lab did the first structure of something bound to the nucleosome. This is a lot of work, a lot of different uh, uh, structures, uh, uh, complexes that we tried to crystallize. Uh, this was done by Ravi Makda in the lab. This is RCC1, a regulator of chromosome condensation. Again, first protein crystallized on the nucleosome. 
And interestingly enough, it also had an arginine, um, uh, important arginine interacting in the acidic patch. The following year, uh, um, KJ Marsh, working with Bob Kingston and, and collaborating with Gideon Arlika, saw the structure of SIR3 on the nucleosome. And then, um, you know, the following year, so about a one a year structure, um, um, Yawen Bai and his colleagues saw, saw the structure of the SEMC, Central America uh, protein, SEMC, uh, a peptide of it bound to the nucleosome. For my lab, a uh, really major breakthrough was, um, you know, we were interested in chromatin enzymes. It was very disappointing that, you know, we had solved the structure of a protein about the nucleosome, but it wasn't a chromatin enzyme. So this is the first chromatin enzyme, first enzyme um, uh, salt on the nucleosome done by Rob McGinty, helped by an undergrad, Ryan Henrici. And then I just want to point out this structure from uh, Cynthia Wahlberger's lab um, a few years later, uh, this structure of the saga d ubiquitin module uh, together with ubiquitin nucleosomes. That was a, a major breakthrough. And then uh, this is a structure that we published last year. Um, it's of histone demethylase on the nucleosome. I'm not really going to talk about this, uh, but this was done by Sang Kim in my lab. So if we just look at the, the sort of historical, historical uh, thing, you know, um, so structure of the nucleosome first done in 1997, 1998, uh, took about um, almost 10 years to get the structure of just a peptide in the nucleosome. Uh, 2010, first uh, structure of uh, protein mounted nucleosome. And you see, we're just getting one, one structure here for multiple years, few more structures uh, in 2016, 2017. And of course, because of cryo-EM, we now have you know, uh, you know, an order of magnitude uh, more, more structures, um, about 25 in the last, in 2019 and 2020. And this has been really wonderful because it's allowed us to see more than just anecdotal information, but really uh, get a, a large number of structures that we can actually derive principles from. And so that's what I'm gonna spend uh, my time talking about today. So, this is the structure of PRC1, the ubiquitation module, the one that Rob McGinty did and Ryan Henrici did in my lab. Um, and some of the principles that we saw here, which um, uh, echo some of the information we had from RCC1, was the idea of multivalent interactions. So there have been a lot of structures of chromatin enzymes with peptides bound. And from those studies, we sort of got the idea that the way that the enzyme got specificity was by recognizing the sequence, let's say, of the peptide. But the structures with, you know, on the nucleosome have really shown us that a lot of enzymes and proteins, really what they're doing is recognizing not just one little part of the nucleosome, but recognizing the entire surface, a large part of the surface. And that makes complete sense because the whole point is, uh, of the nucleosome is, you know, in the cell, these proteins see the nucleosome, they see all the surface of the nucleosome, not just a peptide, not just a little part. And so of course the enzyme is going to use the information available to it, which is the entire nucleosome. And so I'm just going to go back and, and uh, uh, um, so, so what we observed with this was, you know, um, UBC H5C shown in red is interacting with the DNA. And in fact, uh, both the entry exit and, and it right of the diet. Um, BMI1 is interacting with um, the H1, uh, uh, H3, histone H3. Uh, this is actually going to be the N of alpha 1 and uh, the L1 loop that I pointed out. And ring 1B is interacting with the acidic patch. So multiple surfaces are being interacted with. And this is really what we see happen over and over again when we look at uh, structures of things on the nucleosome. And so I'm first going to uh, remind you of, and I think a lot of people here know that the acidic patch on the nucleosome, these set of acidic residues on histone H2A and H2B, that's clearly a hot spot for chromatin proteins and enzymes to interact with on the nucleosome. So what I'm showing you here are just 12 sort of random, selected structures. And what's remarkable, and we saw this when, you know, we, um, when we saw the structure of PLC1, there were only five structures of three proteins, two peptides, and every single one of them had this arginine anchor. Uh, we've got more structures now. The, the arginine anchor doesn't happen all the time, but it happens at least half of the structures which have been published. And um, let me just um, um, show you now um, what I mean. So from the file, it looks like they're all doing very different things, but I'm gonna zoom in. And you'll see in every single case, there is an arginine 
and is interacting essentially the same way with this acidic patch. And I find it still remarkable that all these different proteins doing many, many different things are interacting essentially the same way with this conserved uh, acidic patch on the mutasome. Again, clearly a paradigm for how protein enzymes and proteins recognize the mutasome. Acidic patch is clearly a hot spot. So um, this, a, a lot of credit for what I'm showing you here goes to Rob McGinty. Uh, he's done a very careful analysis. And, um, and this is a figure taken from the, uh, the current opinions um, review article that we've written. So the argument anchor that I just showed you is what's shown here in green. And you see it's highly clustered together. So this is overlay of many different arginines um, um, uh, um, interacting with the city patch. And they adopt essentially the same sort of con uh, confirmation. But there are additional arginines that we're calling variant arginines, which accompany uh, these acidic patches often. Um, they are clustered, but not as well clustered in a, uh, such a tight um, uh, region. Um, so um, arginine, a uh, very arginine type one um, um, interact, for example, in this region, uh, so um, uh, on this uh, periphery of uh, the region that um, the arginine anchor, so the, the canonical arginine anchor is what's shown here, arginine, a very arginine type ones here, uh, sorry, type one is shown here, type two is shown here. And so um, the acidic patch is this entire region over here, and there are multiple arginines that interact with, with this region. Um, it really seems to be arginines that are critical, um, and you'll often see in any given protein that might be an arginine anchor, but then it's accompanied by these variant arginines. Now, is this simply an interesting um, structural thing that doesn't really have a functional significance? Well, there's multiple reasons to, to say that it really is functionally important. So uh, in this work done by Tom Muir and Dave Allison and his colleagues a few years ago, um, they were looking at prone to remodeling enzymes. And what they able to show was the acidic patch as shown here was in fact a target and was in fact very important for not just one or two, but really you know, entire classes of chrome remodelers. So that's one example of why we know that this is important. We also know it's important because of biochemical studies that have accompanied the structural studies that have shown that the arginine anchor, the, the, you know, that I just showed you previously, is often absolutely critical for function. And so I showed you the structure of PRC1, and it is one of those panel of 12. Uh, that's the arginine sitting in the acidic patch. And this is not work that we did, but it's work done by Rachel Clevett and Mary Claire King. And it's a wonderful work because it really shows the functional significance. So they were looking at a patient. Um, it's a very unfortunate situation. It's a patient with neurodevelopmental disorders uh, uh, manifesting both cognitively and physically. And they were able to identify that it appears that it was a single point mutation that was not inherited. This was a spontaneous mutation. Parents don't have this mutation, the, the uh, GUA mutation in one of the copies of the patient, which converts an arginine to a glutamine. And what is that arginine? The mutation is in ring one, the same uh, protein that um, uh, um, component of the PRC1 ubiquitation module that I showed you. And it is in fact the arginine anchor. It is ARG98, uh, the equivalent of ARG98 in this protein over here, which um, is um, um, associated with the uh, developmental disorder. Um, how do they know that in this human patient that the single point mutation is apparently sufficient to cause the disorder? Well, they did uh, experiments in C. elegans using the ortholog in C. elegans and were able to basically mimic a lot of the, the, the phenotypes you would expect. And so we had shown that this arginine was absolutely critical for binding. Mutating it, removing the side chain would uh, reduce binding almost 100 fold um, and also basically eliminate its debiculation function. And we all know that polycone is important for development. So it's not entirely surprising that affecting the function of polycone will cause developmental disorders. But you know, there aren't that many cases where we're able to associate a single point mutation with um, a disease or phenotype. And this is one, one wonderful example where we've got uh, you know, information on many different levels, biochemical, structural. 
All right, so we know the acidic patch is absolutely important. It is really important. It's, again, not used by all proteins, but um, a lot of proteins use it. I'll come back to that a little bit later. But um, there are now uh, uh, additional features um, on the nucleosome I'd like to point out, um, which I have to admit I did not sort of realize until I really, you know, Robert and I started looking at a lot of these structures. So one way we can look at this is to look at the surfaces which are in contact with the different protein. So what I've done here is uh, color in yellow, red, blue, and green, according to the sort of canonical colors, as well as you know, this uh, darker blue color for the DNA. Those surfaces in the nucleosome which are in contact with the particular protein or complex. And you can look at it and see, well, you know, there seems to be lots of different contacts and maybe there's a focus on the acidic patch over here. A lot of them have, have that. But what other features are identified? So that's the acidic patch. And you can see a lot of proteins, uh, but not all. For example, ML1 and CHD1 um, and, um, uh, you know, uh, don't in, in here. Um, but now let's go to a different region. So a lot of regions target what I've already pointed out, the histone H3, alpha-1, L1, elbow. I'm calling it an elbow. Um, when I was staring it, I decided to kind of look at the elbow. Um, I also happened to dislocate my elbow a few days before I was staring at these structures, and so I was you know, very conscious of my elbow. Um, but uh, a lot of them, um, so it's about 40% uh, of the structures that um, interact with um, the um, histone surface uh, that we looked at would uh, have interaction with the histone L1 elbow. And so uh, this is the histone uh, alpha 1 um, L1 region. And so I've got uh, 12 different structures here and all showing interactions with the elbow. Um, in the case of PRC1, it's almost like a cap on the edge of, on the end of that uh, elbow region. Uh, again, many different structures, um, all doing you know different function, and a lot of them have interactions with histone elbow. So I think the histone alpha one L alpha one L one elbow is a hotspot for interactions with uh, chromatin proteins. There is one other alpha one L one elbow which is exposed on the surface of the nucleosome, and that's from histone H two B. Um, the other two, histone H4 and H2A, alpha-1 elbow, L1 elbow are buried, so they're not accessible. And this uh, also has a lot of proteins that interact with it. And so uh, if we look at um, sorry, these 12 proteins, um, you'll see, uh, again, there are interactions with the um, elbow. Uh, there aren't necessarily a lot of um, common residues that I would say, well, if you're interested in the elbow, you know, with the acidic patch, we know that if you're interested in studying it, you can, you can make a, a, a mutation to the acidic patch. It's a very well-defined area. It's a little bit less clear to me uh, in terms of doing mutagenesis, how you would look at, um, you know, the, um, the, the alpha-1 one L, one elbows from H3 and H2B. And the last one that I like to, um, um, highlight for you is the H2B cetonal helix. Uh, if you look at the structure of the nucleosome, you'll realize that this alpha uh, H2B cetonal helix is kind of elevated, exposed on the surface of the nucleosome. And um, about half of the proteins that we looked at um, contained, uh, or structures that we looked at uh, where the, uh, there was interactions with histones, about half of those would have interactions with um, the H2B cetonal helix. Uh, sometimes even sort of engulf the helix, like dot one p, so three um, you know, compass, uh, they basically you know sort of en engulf that that C tonal helix. Others have much more um, uh, limited interactions than a lot of peptide does, and you know um, the acidic patch, as I'm showing you here, is very close to the C tonal helix, um, and so. You know, I think it's important to know that in these structures that we looked at, it's not just because of interaction with the acidic patch. Uh, there are, you know, significant interactions that are happening um, um, uh, in addition to any interaction with the acidic patch is very close by. So, you know, previous to uh, uh, this year, I think a lot of us were focusing on the acidic patch. But what I'm hoping I've shown you today is that there are additional interactions with uh, of a lot of chromatin proteins with the alpha-1, L1, elbow of histone H3 and of histone H2B. 
And then there's also uh, lots of interactions with uh, a lot of proteins make interactions with histone H2B cetonal helix. Now, um, again, you might say, well, you know, what you've done is you've looked at, you know, a lot of structures, 50 or 60 or 70 structures, but, you know, it's still in some ways anecdotal. Um, so Rob McGinty has done a really wonderful um, 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 survey, uh, sort of an unbiased search, uh, proteomic search of uh, uh, proteins that interact with the nucleosome surfaces. And what he did was he made mutations, he and his colleagues made mutations in five regions on the optimal surface. And they found in that in their studies that the acidic patch really is the hotspot, the major hotspot. And in fact, the numbers shown here sort of underestimate just how important the acidic patch is. Um, uh, you can uh, analyze this in a different way because you know some of these numbers here. Um, this is saying that 18% uh, of the proteins interacted here, but some of them, a, a large fraction of those, also interacted in the acidic patch. Um, and so, um, you know, I encourage people to look at this paper. I think it's a very important uh, piece of work. Um, Everything that I just showed you with our structures it actually does make sense in terms of what Rob saw here. And so I think that you know, our analysis is not simply anecdotal. Okay, I've just got a couple minutes left, and I'd like to switch gears now to tell you about some reagents that we've made. Uh, Christine kindly sort of alluded to some of them. Um, so, um, you know, I've very mentioned we have some great undergrads at Penn State, uh, and so. Um, Quite a few years ago, I had ideas of, you know, um, you know, we were making lots of DNA for nucleosome preps. And, you know, we know how to make uh, you know, DNA uh, um, in large quantities. And um, I had this idea for making DNA ladders, which I didn't really execute that, this, this, uh, this vision. Um, it really took Ryan Henrici in the lab. I already mentioned him. He was uh, the person who worked with Rob McGinty on the PRC1 structure. Um, Anyway, so the idea is as follows. Two plasmids that will, high copy number plasmids, when you digest with uh, one enzyme, you get a kill base ladder, and you digest with another enzyme, you get a 100 base pair ladder. If you think about it, you know, if you want to have a kill base ladder of at least one, two, three, four, five kilo bases, that's already 15 kilo bases. And plasmids aren't, you know, that happy when you make them too large, which is why we have two plasmids. The bottom line is that you can make your own DNA ladders for about 1 50th to 100th the cost of commercial ladders. The, the plasma is available from Agene. Um, it literally is just doing a, dig uh, a plasma prep and digesting it with, um, with inexpensive enzymes. So um, if you do 100 pl uh, mil plasma prep of this uh, plasma and 100 mil plasma prep of this one here, uh, we do it in our lab. We can uh, do it for about $5. Um, and that's including the cost of the enzyme, and that's enough for a thousand lanes. And you buy the commercial ladders, it'll be closer to five hundred dollars. Even if you use a, a plastic prep kit; it's still much much cheaper. So if you're interested in this, get them from from Agene. Um, it you know literally DNA ladders for a penny a lane. So this was published a few years ago in in uh, scientific reports, uh, and it's now been distributed to almost 500 labs by Agene to around the world. And it's really fun for me to see, you know, which new country has, has uh, requested it. I got a real kick from learning that somebody in Siberia requested it. Um, so, um, uh, oh, sorry, I should, should mention that. Uh, Ryan was, was uh, helped by uh, James and, and um, uh, Turner with this project. So, um, a few years ago, I was giving a talk, and I mentioned this at the end of the talk, and um, um, uh, the colleague said, you know, Song, this is great, but uh, we spend more money on protein ladders. Can you do anything about that? And we had actually started a project on the protein ladders, which I kind of dropped. And then, you know, uh, this was sort of an inspiration for me and my lab to pursue this. And so this is not published yet. It's been submitted. Um, I hope you hear back from the reviewers in day soon. Um, again, a uh, completely undergraduate project. Um, what we've done is we've made plasmids that express um, individual proteins, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 80, 100. Um, this is work by, done by Joey, Jack, Ryan, and Rosie. Um, and um, um, the key idea here was 
we have several criteria. One of the criteria is we want proteins that migrate properly in the gel. That took a lot of work because proteins don't migrate properly on gels. But we want them to be expressed really well so that you know, we can just do a simple metal affinity purification. Everything contains a his tag uh, and get good purity. And so they're so well expressed. Uh, the same material that you see here is what you see in the gel here. And when you, we, you know, have them at sort of normal dilutions, you don't see any contaminants, even though there might be you know, a little bit of contaminants around. So there's two other things here. Uh, we've also co-expressed them. So we have co-expression vectors we developed in our lab so that you can make, uh, so we have the 10, 30, 50, 100 on one plasmid, 20, 40, 60, 80 on the second plasmid. And so um, you can see here the co-expressed versions. Um, the cost is tiny. So um, if you were to express, the, uh, let's say nine individual proteins I show you here, um, the cost of doing it and, and purifying it will cost you less than hundred dollars. And that's enough for get it, 20,000 lanes. <laughs> which means that you can have a lane for about 40 cents a lane. Um, oh, sorry, uh, uh, for 400 lanes. Um, you do a co-expression, uh, you get less because you're only doing two plasmids, two expression experiments, uh, about a similar cost, uh, really simple to do. Compared to commercial ladders, which will cost you about um, $100 for 100 lanes. Uh, so, you know, it's much, much cheaper, really simple to do. Uh, all it is is uh, simple exp uh, expression in E. coli. Uh, the paper will have um, detailed protocols for how to do this. Um, um, we, we hope that uh, lots of people will find it useful. Um, you know, a lot of labs don't need to worry about the costs of buying DNA or protein ladders, but there are a lot of labs around the world for which you know, this is not an insignificant cost. And we used to be able to buy protein ladders inexpensively. They were uh, sort of simple ladders. It's very difficult to get those now. You have to buy sort of more, more expensive ladders. And I, I hope that this just provides an alternative. You know, if you're happy with your commercial ladders, please continue using them. Uh, but if you want to make your own ladders, uh, you should have uh, an option. Uh, again, this is unpublished work. I hope you'll be published soon. And we plan to make all the plasmids, uh, both the individual plasmids and the co-expression uh, co plasmids available on IGN. And one last thing, uh, each of these contain IgG body domains, so they will work in Westerns. You don't have to have color lad ladders and, and draw your lines on, on your film to be able to see your mercury ladder. Uh, they will just show up um, on your on, on your Westerns uh, because they uh, will be recognized by your second antibody. Okay, with that, um, uh, one of the points in the last year, a couple of years, I've not been able to take a, a more recent picture of my lab. Uh, this is from two years ago now. Um, I'm hoping that we'll be able to be able to meet in person and not be able to take a picture with, with masks on. Um, I'm really lucky to have wonderful people in my lab. Um, and I'm especially lucky to be at Penn State. We have a wonderful set of researchers uh, studying different aspects of chromatin and gene regulation. Um, we have an NIH training ground for graduate students. And we have, we have a, I think, a really nice environment, collaborative environment for not just the PIs, but the postdocs and, and, and graduate students, all of our trainees. So with that, I will stop and um, be happy to, to take any questions you might have. Thank you so much. That was an amazing talk. It's so nice to see all of the structures just kind of synthesized together so we can really, like, there's just so many. So it's, we're really grateful that you can just kind of show us all at once and highlight the key points. Uh, we already have a uh, question, so I will get right to it. Oh, before I do that, if you're interested in joining the coffee chat, please write in the chat box that you would like to join us because we will be kicking people out uh, who are not joining us afterwards because, um, Anyway, so uh, the first person who I will allow to ask a question is Jason Fan. He's raised his hand and I'm going to allow him to talk. Here we go. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, I, uh, yeah, I'm also really excited to, uh, to read that uh, review that's gonna come out. Um, I was wondering with the, um, for example, with the uh, acidic patch uh, uh, arginine anchor binders, um, is there actually a specific um, spatial orientation for like the for the binding uh, proteins, like such that like you can kind of predict like is it does it tend to be like say like N terminal to C terminus like in this specific spatial orientation for like you know all those 60, 70 um, you know complexes like such that you can kind of like say if you uh, see like an arginine anchor motif in like another protein you're studying you can kind of predict like 
how they're like overlaid, like how what orientation they're binding and things like that? Yeah, I, I think the answer is no. So if we just look at this, you know, showing this again, um, the arginine anchor itself is coming often from a loop, but sometimes from alpha helices. Okay, so because the alpha helix here, risk BAF, um, 53 BP1, the, the uh, arginine is coming from, from a, um, uh, a helix. So I'm often asked is, um, is there a sequence motif that defines an arginine anchor? My original answer was no, because you, know, you basically had an arginine on a loop and it's so easy to find an arginine on a loop. Now we're looking at the variant arginines that I talked about. Um, I would say that if you're looking for something that, by, that you think you know, potential for an arginine anchor, look for um, regions of your protein that have multiple arginines and they're often accompanied by a few serines. So multiple arginines. Um, the other thing I would say is um, mutate the, the nucleosome, make it, you know, use um, acidic patch mutation uh, nucleosome. I think you can even buy them now from EpiCypher and, and other places um, because that will tell you if the acidic patch is important and that might give you more sort of uh, reasons to then explore what's in your protein if you can try and find you know, the, the arginines um, in, in a region that are important. The other experiment I'd like to advocate is, I meant to put this into the talk, I'm sorry I didn't do so. Um, we have a, a paper from 2010, I think it is, um, from my lab. Um, England is the first author. It was an undergrad in the lab um, where we used a competition assay to look at for uh, whether, uh, basically using the LANA peptide. Remember the LANA peptide also binds to the acidic patch. So you can take a LANA peptide and then you can titrate it and see what it affects the function of your protein because it will then compete with the acidic patch. So that's you know, a nice little experiment you can do. And you can look at the, we did it a particular way. It was a, a competition pull down. You can look at that JMB paper, England first author, uh, if you're interested. Hoping that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Thank you. Sure. I am also a fan of the LANA peptide competition experiment. <laughs> good, good. Yeah, it's, it's you know, it's, 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 in some ways, it's a very simple experiment to do. Um, but uh, because the LANA peptide is so small, uh, it sort of tells you, hey, there's a very good chance it's actually interacting with the acidic patch. Right. Um, okay, so we're running out of, out of time, but I would like to ask one more question from Dr. Felix muller Planet. He asks, well, first he says, great talk, I agree. Um, isn't it peculiar that lysine is never employed as an electrostatic anchor to the acidic patch? What makes arginine superior over lysine? Yeah, Felix, great question. Um, I think it's because the arginine with the guanidinium group, um, so if you look at the details of those, uh, I didn't show sort of the, the, all the um, uh, hydrogen bonds it makes, but the guanidinium group really anchors, and you know, this is why it's such a wonderful name that Rob came out with, the arginine anchor. Um, it really, you know, those multiple interactions from the guanidinium group with the acidic patch, with that region, is, uh, I think, energetically much better than uh, simply having a lysine. Um, I do think it's interesting that you basically don't see lysines. Maybe there'll be a lysine that we see in the future, but you know, we haven't seen it. Christine, I'm looking at the chat, uh, a Q&A, and there's a question. Uh, can I oh. go ahead and answer that? Oh, absolutely. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> and then so, after this, go ahead into the coffee chat. <laughs> yeah, so you sang who was asking uh, whether I, I think there's potential for other interaction hotspots in nucleosome, or do I think this is it? Um, I don't want to say, I, you know, that it's impossible there might be additional um, uh, uh, surfaces, but um, I, I think this is the major set. Um, so I'll tell you that I originally thought that, uh, I, I think you still see my screen, is that correct? Mm -hmm. okay. I originally thought this depression over here would be a hot spot. It just looked interesting to me. And you know, Rob's, again, unbiased search indicates, no, that's not, you know, again, not necessarily never, but that's unlikely to be important. I think this, and this is one reason why I think this work is so important because um, it defines regions, uh, you know, doing a proteomic screen um, and, you know, really does emphasize the acidic patch um, as, you know, a major, major hotspot. Mm, definitely, that's 
yeah, I have a lot of questions, but I'm going to ask them in the coffee chat. <laughs> so um, we're going to start promoting people to panelists. It'll look like you've been kicked out, but it should only last for 30 seconds and then you'll be back. And then everyone else, thank you all for joining us today and we'll be back in two weeks.